loving Jesus All our sins and griefs to bear And what a privilege to carry Everything to God in prayer What peace we often forfeit Oh, what needless pain we bear All because we do not carry Everything to God and
Good morning, happy Sunday. Welcome to New Garden Online. If this is your first time joining us, my name is Jeff. I'm the lead minister at New Garden Church. And while we typically gather at DuPont Tyler Middle School in Hermitage right now, we're still online. We've got a great morning plan. We're in week two of our new sermon series, The Art of Being Unordinary. I'm excited to share that with you in a little bit. But before we get there, let's jump into the chat room, say good morning, let us know you're here, and let's answer a question. If you were famous for a talent, what would it be? And it doesn't have to be like some normal celebrity thing. It could be like your blueberry muffins or uh, famous for taking awesome naps or something like that. So let's jump into the chat room. If you could choose to be famous for something, what would it be? Welcome to New Garden Church. It is so good to be back with y'all this morning. I know that a lot of you have been on fall break this past week, and I hope that it has been a fun and restful time and that you're ready to go and tackle this next week. And so we are glad that you are choosing to spend the last day of your fall break with us, hanging out and worshiping together. If this is your first time at New Garden, we are super excited that you joined us today and we want you to feel so welcome and we want to connect with you. And one way we want to connect with you is through a connect card. There's a button at the top of your screen that says connect card and if you click there, it'll take you to a page where you can enter your name and your email address and that'll help us to get to know who you are and it'll sign you up for our newsletter so you'll know what's going on with us. It will also let you choose one of four charities. And guess what? We will donate $10 to the charity you pick because we are so excited that you joined us today. So if you're a first time guest, please fill out a connect card and don't miss out on that opportunity to give back for free. Um, it is mid-October now, which is wild. And that means several things for us. At New Garden, okay? Number one, first it means that we are partnering with Compassion this month. So our check-ins are benefiting Compassion and going toward giving care to children in need through their organization. So if you are a Facebooker or an Instagrammer, please check in at New Garden Church today and yeah, you can use the hashtag Compassion for Kids and uh, your check-ins will do good and go toward giving care to children in need. The second thing um, that mid-October means is that our mobile food pantry is coming up. Mobile food pantry. And it is on October 24th. And if you have never been to one of the mobile food pantries, you should totally make plans to be there on October 24th in the morning. It is um, a really cool experience and it is an awesome way to serve our community and show Hermitage that we're for Hermitage. So if you're planning on being there on October 24th at DuPont Tyler, you can sign up at forhermitage.com and let us know that you're coming and helping to uh, volunteer at the mobile food pantry. The third thing that mid-October means for us is that the fall retreat is coming up, which I am so excited about. And guess what? You are invited. Yes, you are invited. Um, if you're a student or not, that is great. You're invited. The more the merrier. We are having fall retreat at Camp Maribah, and it is 
beautiful and it is big enough for us to spread out and to have a bunch of people there. And I would love for you to be one of the people at Fall Retreat. So uh, whether you can just come for a few hours on Saturday or you're interested in coming for the whole weekend, um, I would love to have you there. The signups are live on our website and if you want just some more information about Fall Retreat, you can reach out to me. Um, you can email or text me, and I'd love to talk to you about it. If you're interested in serving at Fall Retreat, um, there are opportunities for that too. So that is November 6th through 8th. So write it down on your calendar, Fall Retreat. Um, lastly, we are meeting tonight and it is in a new location, sort of. We are going to be meeting in the community center that is at Hermitage Park. So you can drive to the same place, park in the same place, just come inside the building. And the only thing that is different is that masks are required inside the building. So please bring your mask tonight. Kids 30 is happening at 5.30 and everyone is invited at 6 to come and hang out and we'd love to see you there. We'll have some extra masks in case you forget yours, but please do bring yours if you have one. Um, and we're excited to see you tonight and hang out together. Um, and we're just so glad that you chose to be with us this morning. Welcome to New Garden. What's up? I hope that you're doing well. Michael here. I wanted to tell you that New Garden Church, us, we're hosting another mobile food pantry on Saturday, October 24th at DuPont Tyler Middle School. So last time we were able to help distribute food to over a thousand people in total. So that said, in order to do that, we need volunteers. So. We are not able to do what we do without volunteers from our church community and also the greater Hermitage community. So if you want to come volunteer with us, and I promise you it's going to be a great day, we will need volunteers from about 7.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. And if you can't come for that whole four hours, that's okay. We would love to have you when you can come, but we will need volunteers that whole time. So. If you want to come volunteer with us on Saturday, October 24th at the Mobile Food Pantry, here's what you can do. Number one, need to wear a mask. So this is a social distant thing. We want to be taking the proper precautions to make sure that we are not uh, communicating the sickness to each other and we're not communicating sickness to the people that we are serving. So wear a mask. Number two, you can invite a friend. Okay, you can invite a friend. They're going to have a great time too, I promise. And number three, you can let us know you're coming by going to www.forhermitage.com. It's going to be a really awesome day and I would love to see you then. Once again, Saturday morning, October 24th, we're hosting a mobile food pantry and we'd love to see you there. Have a good day.
So we kicked off a new series last week called The Art of Being Unordinary. And we began exploring how we can be a community that is in the world but not of the world. A group of people who have dedicated themselves to a different set of values, a new way of living, so that when the world sees us, they see something different. God has called us to be a peculiar people with a peculiar way of interacting with one another. And we're basing this invitation to be different from Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter 12 when he writes, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. A few sentences later, in verse 10, he gives us an example of how we can be living sacrifices when he says, love one another deeply as brothers and sisters. This love one another idea shows up over and over and over in the New Testament. So where did Paul and John and Peter get this message to write in these letters? Well, it comes from Jesus. (laughs) We looked at last week at Jesus' final words to his disciples before he goes to the cross, and he lets them know that they're, they're... supposed to love one another. But he's been preaching this message like his entire ministry. In Matthew 22, we find him explaining what the greatest command we can do in this life. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they came together and one of them, an expert in the law, asked a question to test him. Teacher, which command in the law is the greatest? He said to him, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets depend on these two commands. Now I think it's important to slow down and focus on this idea and take Jesus at his word that he wants us to obey what he taught, that we should love God and love people. So today we want to focus on what it means for us to truly follow King Jesus and grow in our capacity to love. We already spent a week on the idea of love, but it's so central to being a one another church that we're going to meditate on it again today before we move into one another, other one another passages in the scripture. So we're going to be guided in our reflections on what it means to love by one of the most beautiful expositions of what love is for Christians anywhere in the whole Bible. It's in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians in chapter 13. Now Paul wrote this letter to a church community which by this point was a network of house churches that he had started in the bustling city of Corinth. But he knew these people because he had helped start the church and he was around all of them when they became followers of Jesus. And the reason he's writing this letter is he heard a report that things were not going well in Corinth. Now maybe you know this chapter, maybe you don't, but most people will have heard it read at a wedding because it's about love. But of course, Paul didn't write this for married people. He wrote this as a part of his critique and challenge of a church community that he thought was just betraying Jesus at every turn. They were a bunch of Christians in this church community suing each other, really angry at each other, all of these broken relationships. There was a guy sleeping with his mother-in-law in in the church community. Uh, Their Sunday gatherings were a wreck. How they took communion was really messed up. And then specifically, in the section he's talking about here, there were a number of people who were having really profound experiences of worship in their Sunday gathering. Uh, probably very different than what we think when we think of Sunday morning. It, it wouldn't be a, like a mega church, just a small group of people who would gather in a house and would be more like an interactive Bible study with a time of worship. And then some of them had adopted and taken on this prayer practice that Paul himself practiced of praying and speaking in unknown languages. But the way they were doing it, it was not the way Paul did it. They would just burst out in the gathering and start speaking something nobody could comprehend. And Paul is giving instruction to stop it uh, because it's weirding all these people out as he talks about in chapter 14. And he says, listen, that's a totally appropriate way to pray, but don't freak people out when they come into the gathering. I mean, find a more appropriate way to do it. And it was also the case that people would have a prophecy or something that they felt the whole community needed to hear from Jesus. And so Uh, They would open up the scriptures, but then people were interrupting each other and being like, uh, no one can actually start talking about it. They were just talking over each other. And Paul says, hey, time out. Your Sunday gathering is actually having the opposite purpose of what Sunday gatherings should be about, which is celebrating the good news and reminding us all that we're a community of love because of Jesus' love for us. 
And so into that chaos of a church community, he writes this. Now, we're going to start at the end of chapter 12 and then read all of chapter 13. So this is what Paul writes. But desire the greater gifts, and I will show you an even better way. If I speak human or angelic tongues, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith so that I can move mountains but do not have love, I'm nothing. And if I give all of my possessions and if I give over my body in order to boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It is not boastful. It is not arrogant. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not irritable and does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put aside childish things. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, as I am fully known. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. That is a wonderfully crafted and beautifully worded exposition of what the love of God truly is. Which is why this chapter kind of stands out of the Bible. I mean, it's often taken out of context. But when you read it in this context, it's written to a community of followers of Jesus who are not doing this. So he has to show what love actually is. Now, love is one of those words in our English language that's it's kind of stretchy. So you can use it in a lot of ways, but that ability to stretch also makes it harder to define and and often unhelpful uh, because I love hamburgers and I love my wife. I love the outdoors and I love to nap. I love my children and I also love to brush my teeth. So I can say the same English word, but if the word love means the same thing in each of those scenarios, I've got big issues. Um, It's an unhelpful word because it refers to something that I have a preference for, something that I've given a lifelong commitment to, and then just something that I enjoy. So the problem that raises then is when you become a follower of Jesus and there's all this talk about love, we just import into that word all of our cultural nuances and then we read the Bible or we hear the teachings of Jesus and we think we already know what it means. So we need to first dismantle it and start over. So what does Paul mean? when he uses this word. This is where it's a great help that we have 13 of his letters in the New Testament because we can get a whole range of his thought over a decade and a half of how he used words and thought about Jesus and the good news. And so here's what Paul means at least when he uses the word love and it's anchored in the teachings of Jesus. It's not referring primarily as it does in our culture to a a feeling that happens to you. There is feeling involved as we'll see, but Primarily, the word love refers to actions or behavior. Love is something you do. If you watch Jesus use the word love Paul, and watch Paul use the word love, it's something you do to people. It's not something you first and foremost feel, and that's significant because you, we, you know our feelings about people change and they shift over time. But love, according to Jesus and Paul, is something very different. It's about this settled purpose to behave and choose to act in this way. Uh, Sometimes you feel it, sometimes you do not feel it, but you do it anyway. That's love according to Jesus and Paul. So let's look at how Paul uses the word love in his letters. In Galatians 2 uh, verse 20, he says, The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Not had a, a good feeling about me, but who loved me and did something about it, gave himself for me. In Ephesians chapter 5, he says this, Therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children, and walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. So Jesus, he doesn't just 
feel something for us, he actually does something for us. And then in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, Paul writes, But God proves his own love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So you can imagine the feeling that God has for us, that while we're sinners, there's this disconnect, right? I mean, you got to be thinking, God can't be feeling the love for us because we're separated. But that's not the case in how he acts. He chooses that while we're still sinners, he sends Jesus to die for us. So people may define love in different ways, but as followers of Jesus, uh, where is the place we should look to see what love is? Well, Sunday school answer, Jesus. And if you look at how Jesus lived and loved, I think we can say that Jesus defined love as this. That love is a settled purpose to act in a way that brings about the well-being of another person regardless of how they respond. And that's love for a Christian. It's about a choice that I make. It's motivated by love, but you don't always feel that motivation. And so it comes down to the purpose to seek the well-being of another person, regardless of how they respond to me. And that motivation and the action is what's referred to by agape love. And it's not abstract. Paul just says, look at how Jesus did things. That's what I'm talking about. That's how he knows that he's loved. And so what we're going to do today is very practical. Paul is not going to let this remain theoretical in this letter that he writes. We're going to focus in on the small middle paragraph verses 4 through the beginning of verse 8. And Paul gives 16 short two to three words each definitions of love. So if you are curious about what the word love means as a Christian, uh, you have those examples. It refers to action and something Jesus did that defines it. And now Paul is going to give this fuller picture of what love is. Uh, But before we hear from Paul, I want to get two pictures in our mind which come from my house. Alright, so the first thing I want you to have in mind is that of a vacuum cleaner. Now, um, in our house, this gets used quite often because we have a dog and two children, and the vacuum is one of Finn's like favorite Uh, chores to help out with and he's getting so much better but early on when he wanted to help uh, it was actually probably more destructive than it was helpful because if you think about a vacuum cleaner uh, what it is about is about sucking in all the world around it it's about creating this negative pressure within itself um, that just sucks everything into its oblivion and everything that goes in and comes into contact becomes dusty and dirty and you know if you've ever sucked something valuable up into the vacuum you like get in there and try and dig it all out it's it's so nasty um and finn even you know sometimes uh the shoes by our front door if he gets too close you know it'll snag like a shoelace and it'll just suck the whole like shoelace in you're like oh you gotta turn it off and um and so this is one picture of the love in our culture that I want you to have in mind. This um, negative pressure that just sucks everything into itself and just causes oblivion. The other thing in our house that uh, is used quite often is some sort of air freshener. Now this is, this one's not my favorite. It's a little bit too lemony for me. Um, but we had this one that it smelled, I want to say it smelled like birthday cake or something like that. But you would just, you do one spray And if you give it enough time, it just goes throughout the whole house. It spreads, and everywhere it goes, things get better. Like, there's this pleasant aroma, and you enjoy it. Um, And that's another picture of love. Uh, One would be the selfish love, and one would be uh, self-sacrificial love, about giving and moving out to make other people better, whereas the vacuum often, I'm portraying today at least, as just a place that is so inwardly focused. So today, as we go along, I want you to have these two kind of mental pictures in mind. So I'll set that over here for now. So here's my two vivid pictures of these alternate definitions of love, okay? So uh, you've got love in a culture, our culture, that's primarily about desire and affection, that its ultimate source is the self-regard and Uh, how what you have to bring or offer is what satisfies and brings meaning and purpose to my life. And if that's the case, then the odds are it's not going to last very long. And then all of a sudden, you and I, we become these relational vacuums, just constantly drawing each other into our own character flaws and our own search for meaning and purpose 
and this love and affirmation. And so not only do I end up this bottomless pit of needing affection and affirmation, but odds are you're going to be pretty miserable if you get drawn into my relational vacuum. I mean, vacuums are what humans are. But the way of Jesus is different. It's this commitment that's driven out of this inner life source of perpetual others focus. And the word Jesus and Paul used to describe that is agape. It's perpetually outward oriented. And the paradox of this love is that the more I give out of myself to others, uh, the more I become truly human and discover myself. That's the vision that Paul is describing here. Uh, So we get these two fixed items in your mind and let's turn to this 16 part definition of love. The first two things that Paul defines in this Jesus style of love is that love is patient and love is kind. So think about this in terms of the two images of the vacuum and the, the spray. So you spray the fragrance and it takes time to move through the air. It takes time to explore new spaces. And my temptation is always to spray more. Uh, the directions are spray once and wait, but I want to keep going. Uh, and the spray is saying, Jeff, slow down, hold on, wait a minute, give it time to work. And so love has time to give. And so if you flip that over to the opposite, impatience is this inability to give people the time that they need or want. But the first thing love is, is giving of time. And love has this discernment about it, that um, about the other, that I might... I might know what's good for somebody, but if I don't do it in the right time, it's not love. If I force something or give up too early and walk away, that's not love. So love has time to give, time to be patient, time to love. So this is about a focus on the other and what they might need or what they might require. And all of a sudden you realize that's what impatience is. It's this I have a timeline for how the next hour is going to work. And if anybody throws me off my schedule, uh, what's my typical response? You know, I I come in and my expectation is everybody works on my timeline. Paul would say that's not love. It's the inability to give time. And then Paul pairs it with a second word, kind. That love is kind. It's connected to a word in the language that means pleasant. So let's think about the vacuum. It's this negative pressure, this kind of atmosphere that surrounds me. So if you enter a room or somebody enters your personal space, you know, what do they feel? Do they sense welcome? Do they sense hospitality? Uh, Do they sense that, uh, that they're cared for or paid attention to? Kindness, this is love. It's about the attention to how the other person perceives entering my space. However long they are in my space, I want them to know they matter. Time to give and accommodating or hospitable. This is where Paul starts. Now, of course, he's not writing this in the abstract, but he's got specific people, specific situations in his mind. But he's writing this to a church community who is exhibiting this inability to give time and a lack of welcome in how they treat each other uh, in the Sunday gathering. So that's why he wrote this in the first place. So is he writing about you? Uh, or is he writing to you? Are we an example of what Paul is trying to get across, or are we the audience he is trying to straighten out? Um, Are we patient? Are we kind? So from here, you can see he starts with those two, and I've tried to group them together because it's not just this endless string of ideas. Some of them go together. They flow together in this little section here by little section here. So uh, from here, he goes into eight statements about what love is not. So sometimes something is so beautiful and profound, you can only talk about what it is by defining what it's not. And that's what he's doing right here. Eight things that love is not uh, that will give you an insight into what love actually is, Jesus style. The first one is envious, or other translations say jealous. So think about the vacuum. So what does it mean to be envious or jealous? So I, I come into contact with another person And they've got something great going on in their story. Something great that just happened in their life. Love is able, for the sake of that person, to just say, that's awesome. Love will experience joy at the good fortune of another person because they're a human being and they're awesome. 
And I'm so excited about what's happening for them. Um, but, I, but see, what love is not is a vacuum. So what the vacuum does is it just sucks everything into itself. So it's this inability to rejoice in the good fortune of another person because all I'm thinking about when they talk about the good things in their lives, all it does for me is highlight the lack of those things in my own life. The world is just torture for somebody who is a vacuum because anything good that happens to your friends just highlights all of the good things that are not happening to you. So love is this capacity to be happy and to experience joy at the good fortune of another, even though that's not what's happening in my own life. And this idea of envy or jealousy connects to the next three that are all connected here. So it doesn't boast, it's not arrogant, it's not rude. So boasting, we can probably picture somebody and their words, people who are constantly talking about themselves and their accomplishments. So why does a person do that? Well, that can be rooted in a couple of mindsets. The one that he highlights here is arrogance. And the word uh, he uses is really clever. It's a metaphor. Uh, and some of you have it maybe in your translations to inflate or puff up. So think of a balloon. You blow a balloon up. That's the word he uses. It's somebody whose favorite topic is themselves. Uh, their favorite topic of conversation is all about me. It's someone who is self-inflated, someone who genuinely thinks that they're more important than everybody else around them. And then, of course, if they're constantly talking about themselves because they really believe that they're more important than everyone else, then that's going to result not just in words. That mindset is going to result in behavior that he calls rude. So there is a connection here. Uh, I'm probably not just going to talk about myself. I'm going to pay attention to what's going. Uh, I'm not going to pay attention to what's going on with you either. I'm going to act in ways that violate your dignity as a human being. And so it's this little connected group. We have this inability to think about other people and what's happening with them, and that's because I'm so focused on the thing inside my vacuum, and it means that I only draw attention to myself. And then I behave in ways that actually hurt and damage other people when they get sucked into my dark, self-centered life. So Paul gives us four things that love is not. Paul then gives us a second group of what love is not. Is not self-seeking, is not irritable, and does not keep a record of wrongs. It is not self-seeking. Of course, this doesn't mean that you should give up on taking care of yourself. You still need to eat, take a bath, you know, sorry kids, you still have to brush your teeth, but he's talking about prioritizing my interests, my agendas, my time, my to-do list so consistently over that of other people that it generates all of these other problems. Somebody who perpetually prioritizes their interests over another person and what they value over what other people value, when they're forced to do work on someone else's timetable or they bump up against someone else's views, what is their natural response? anger or being irritable. Why? Because it's not what I want. I want to do what I want to do. You know, this is what a four-year-old does and some people never grow out of it. That's what this is. Somebody who really believes that their deal is more important than anything else going on. Uh, that, that I'm going to be in this agitated state of being. Uh, and then when you exist in that state of being, the people who cross you and agitate you and violate uh, what you think is most important you never forget. You never forget it. You remember the people who crossed you and who don't value what you value. It's this lifeless vacuum. It's this way of existing in the universe that everybody has to get sucked into here and they don't and they become filthy in the process and so do I. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness but rejoices in the truth. Finally, one we think we got this. Like we don't do this. Uh, we don't see evil in the world and cheer it on. Often when we see other people do something wrong, uh, we're able to rightly judge their behavior. You know, when other people do those things, we think, that's so horrible, I wish they would just, you know, follow Jesus because love doesn't delight in wrongdoing. But the fact is, I choose these behaviors. Like all of the time, I choose them. I clearly like behaving this way because I keep doing it. And so what love is able to do, it's able to name that and to no longer see pleasure or benefit from those things of existing as a human, uh, but can rejoice in the truth. So we rejoice or we celebrate truth. Truth 
is what is happening when you face the reality that I am not great. Apparently, knowing the truth about who we are can be celebrated. It's a paradox of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. There's something about how Jesus lives and talks and treats people as you read about him. And while it's noble and inspiring, it's also true. You say, there is this truly human one right here. But at the same time, it exposes all of the wrongdoing inside of me. And if I'm a follower of Jesus, apparently that's worth rejoicing. It's worth celebrating that there's something about following Jesus that is perpetually inconvenient. The moment that Jesus becomes uh, simply somebody who supports my value system that I already think uh, and supports what I know and supports what I believe, you know you're not following Jesus anymore. There's something about existing in this perpetual state of vulnerability and second-guessing your motivations and yourself knowing that there's all this wrongdoing that I delight in. And so what I rejoice in is having the spotlight show all of my faults and my failures. And it's not because we love self-loathing at New Garden or we hate ourselves. It's actually the opposite, that love is freedom. And it's Jesus' love that changes us. Jesus gives of himself, and he's not less himself when he loves. We are actually more ourselves because of it. And then we exist together as a family. So then Paul shifts to show us the unending nature of love. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now English translations will usually say either all things or always. I think always is a better way to go. We don't believe all things. If someone says the earth is flat, we don't say, okay, we believe all things. So what does he mean all things is? in all circumstances, in all situations consistently, always. So that's why I think our English translations that go this way of always help us get more what he's saying. So uh, love bears always, to bear, to hold something up, to support. Love is always supportive. If love is truly others focused, then it knows that other people's lives are hard. And so I'm going to be a source of stable support in the lives of people around me. And that's because it always believes or trusts. It's a trust that I'm in this relationship with someone who is difficult. But I know this person is made in the image of God. And they're acting like a dusty vacuum right now. But I believe that Jesus is doing something and can do something in this person to turn them into the very opposite of what they are right now. And so love will always hope. Love will always hope for the best for this person. Even if somebody hurt me, it doesn't mean I need to spend all my time around them, but it means I reach a place where I'm able to think about this person that hurt me and think, what happened to them? Like, what are the things they've experienced that makes them behave the way they did to me seem right to them? And so love is able to hope and say, I hope the best for them. And I hope they realize how much Jesus loves them and that they can find a better way forward. Love bears always. Love believes always. Love hopes always and love endures always. Love knows for any meaningful relationship to grow and be healthy that there will be setbacks and there will be challenges. But through it all, love never fails. So Paul, he gives us 16 ways that I have failed to love in the last seven days, right? So how are you feeling? Like, where did Paul even get this idea of how to exist as someone who can live like this? Where did Paul get his definition of love, someone whose life defines love? Jesus. Like, he's the human that you and I are made to be, but we perpetually fail to be. And that's the point, that love is able to shine the spotlight on all my wrongdoing and all my flaws and all my failures. And the paradox of being a Christian and receiving Jesus' love is that this exposure of what's inside of me, it drives me neither to denial um, that those things don't exist, but also neither to despair that there is no hope. There is no reason denying how we actually behave. I mean, we, and think about each other. We're just a whole planet of relational vacuums colliding into each other, sucking each other into our own oblivion. But the paradox of the good news is that it's precisely through that acknowledgement of my shortcomings 
that I find my avoidance of despair because of who Jesus is and his victory over our sin and over our death. This is why the cross is a crucial symbol of Christianity. On the cross is precisely where Jesus allowed himself to get sucked into the vacuum of our selfishness and sin, and he allowed it to destroy him. But our core confession is that God's love for us and the person of Jesus is more powerful than our own vacuum and our sin and our death. It's what we celebrate every Sunday as we gather on the first day of the week, which is the day Jesus conquered the power of death and sin. And so we don't go the path of despair either because we believe that Jesus is real and that he is in our midst, that the person who embodies this agape love is alive, that his actual life presence is working on us, messing with us, pushing us, growing us. And so we come to Jesus in humility and we leave triumphant, not because of what we have done, but because of what he has done. Because what's valuable and true about me is that the Son of God loves me and he gave himself for me. That's what's true about me. I know what kind of person I am uh, when I'm left to my own devices, but I'm not left to my own devices and that's the whole point. I want to close by reading through this description of love again. But I want you to apply it to someone in your life. Maybe it's someone in your family that you need to take a step closer to showing them this love. It may be a neighbor, a coworker, a friend, uh, at school, or a teacher. But I want you to get that person in your mind today as we take the bread and we take the cup. And pray about the kind of human being that you are towards that person. And confess what you need to confess and dream and pray about what you could become for that person in your life in the name of Jesus. So in the last seven days, who did you lose your patience with? Who were you unkind to in the last week? Whose good fortune were you unable to celebrate because you were so self-focused? Who did you talk about yourself way too much when you were with this week? Who do you think you're way better than so that you treat them in ways that violate their dignity? Who did you ignore their priorities so that you could prioritize your own and therefore you lost your temper with them when they didn't think Your thing was more important than their thing, and now you're bitter and resentful about it. In what ways does your behavior show that you actually choose to live this way? What would it look like to celebrate the truth of who you really are, left to your own devices and in the light of the love of Jesus? Who did you back out on this week? Uh, Who have you given up believing in and hoping for? Who were you not around for when they needed you? Who did you fail? So this week, as you take the bread and you take the cup, you receive the love of Jesus. And so as you hold the person you need to love in your mind, we also hold the person of love in our mind, the person of Jesus, who loved us and gave himself for us. And we think about the love we have been given by Jesus. We pray for ways we can give love to others. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for your love. We thank you for the ways that you have showed your love to us. And today as we take the bread and we take the cup, we remember how you showed your love for us in giving your life for us. And so God, we pray that your spirit would live in us and guide us to give our lives for others, to show your love to others. Lord, we thank you for loving us. And through your name we pray. Amen.
much more than we could ever bring to you. So we bring all that we are, cause you gave it all for us to Thanks again for being with us this morning. I hope you found today encouraging and challenging as we go and try and show the love to people that Jesus shows to us. I want to remind you, you can text the word love to 615-455-2212. That'll get you on a list to start receiving some encouragements, some verses, some ideas in the coming weeks as we continue the journey of what it means to love one another as a body of followers of Jesus. I want to remind you tonight, 5.30, our kids are going to be meeting at the Hermitage Community Center, and the adults will start meeting at 6. We're moving indoors. We're going to have lights. We're going to have uh, HVAC to keep us warm, a little bit different than last week. So uh, please join us. Remember, please wear a mask. Don't come if you're not feeling well. Um, but we're going to be talking about what it means to love each other and love the world tonight. And we will be joining you next Sunday online again as we continue this journey of what it means uh, to be unordinary in this world and to love one another. So see you next Sunday.